Let us begin with a word of prayer. If you would, approach God's presence with me. Almighty Father, we need your assistance that our minds might be prepared to um, acknowledge your awesome presence, Father, to uh, exalt the Word of God for the ears of our uh, soul, that they might be alive, that we might receive your words, Father, that they would uh, change us, that they would humble us, Father, that they would uh, lead us on the path of salvation, Father, that we would uh, bring glory to you. We confess that you are almighty, you are beyond description, you are a God that saves. Uh, you sent your one and only Son to die, to be buried, and to rise again to newness of life. Um, and Father, we just worship you and thank you for it. Help me, Father, give me um, strength to proclaim uh, something of how beautiful you are. And Father, just bless this special congregation. Give us the strength to be your hands and feet in this community. These things we ask in confidence of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 6 is where we're going to continue this morning. We've been studying as a congregation the spiritual armor as it's laid out by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6. We're going to be looking at the 16th verse this morning discussing the shield of faith. So if you've got a Bible you'd like to follow along, Ephesians 6, verse 16. Paul, by the Spirit, gives us these words. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Notice here once more, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. I'd like to give you, um, by way of introduction, uh, that grand definition that appears at the beginning of the 11th chapter of Hebrews, this definition of faith. The apostle says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So this helps us to think about this wonderful and all-important concept here of faith and gives us an image of what this shield is to the believer. As we perceive with our natural senses, faith has the ability to perceive spiritual things in the kingdom of God, eternal things. As we've been discussing this all-important chapter. Our minds have been uh, conformed to this concept that we are in the midst of a spiritual warfare. Some uh, people's view of Christianity is more of a walk in the park. It's more of a, a picnic. It's more of ease and comfort. This is something that is pretty popular in our current society. But according to the apostle, as he views the Christian life, he likens it to a war. And based on this, this is ammunition. This is a warning to our souls that we might be prepared, that we might take up each one of these pieces of divine armor in order that we might contend against devils and Satan himself. And so we must acknowledge the danger that we are in. No soldier would conceive, his worst fear would be to enter the conflict, to enter war without his shield. 
the soldier has a healthy respect for the archer who fires with precision his arrows and his darts, and he aims to kill in the same way. With holy reverence, we are to consider the might and the power of our foe and the necessity to take up this divine shield of faith for the protection of our souls. As we try to determine what is the sense of the author uh, regarding these flaming darts, I would like to suggest to you that um, this is the opposite of faith. These are lies. These are assaults against our faith. Look at how our Lord describes the character of the devil in John 8, 44. He says, There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so here we have a picture of the weapons. This is what radiates and comes forth from the enemy of mankind, lies and deception. The weapons of the devil consist of lies, half-truths, and the twisting of Scripture. If you remember that story at the beginning of the Gospels when Jesus is led away by the Spirit into the wilderness. We have a picture of spiritual warfare, and that conflict was not of the flesh. It was not carnal. It was not with swords and weapons, flesh and blood. But the war was centered around the words and a argumentation that surrounded the Word of God And we see how the devil tried to lie and manipulate and twist the Scripture and shoot these fiery darts at our Lord. And Jesus, of course, responded in faith. Israel, in their 40 years of wilderness wandering, possessed not this shield of faith. They were defenseless. They marched into battle without the proper armor of God. Consequently, they were hit by these flaming arrows. And we read in Hebrews 3.19 the following. So we see that they, that is Israel, were unable to enter, it's referring to the promised land, because of unbelief. We see these fiery darts from the evil one penetrated the armor of Israel, their carnal armor that they had at best, and this was a fatal blow to the point at which we read that they were not able to enter the promised land. And this warning is not just for Israel, but in the apostle's mind, he envisions the church and warns them to take this example into consideration and apply it to the kingdom of God. And so we read back in verse 12 in the same chapter, he says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin." For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And so the apostle tells us that we are to encourage one another, right, with the things of God, to build one another's faith up that we might have the shield up so that we are not struck with this spirit of unbelief that our fate is not the same as Israel, that we fail to enter into the eternal rest of God. The truth of God and His promises are the lifeblood of the godly. These 
we accept by faith. The Bible says that the righteous shall live by faith. It is our very way of life. It is our existence. We are defined by a people of faith who believe the testimony of God and follow in the words of God and shape our lives according to this unseen hope that is before us. Yet by faith we accept um, God's revealed will. And at the center of this, I'd like to suggest to you most importantly as we try to define what is the shield of faith at the pinnacle, at the root, at the heart of hearts of the Christian religion, we have justifying faith, that is, a faith that believes in Jesus Christ and in the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. This is what it is to have the shield of faith, the one who has believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Paul in Romans 4 describes Abraham, who is in Scripture uh, seen as the man of faith. If you want to understand what faith is, if we want to understand what it is to have this shield about us, to have this heavenly and divine protection, we need to understand this man. Paul speaks of this great man and his trust in God. He describes how the Lord came to him and gave him promises concerning his son. The word of God was spoken to him, and Abraham, in faith, he believed the testimony, and he was reckoned, considered to be righteous based on his faith. The apostle continues and says that this um, applies to us in, in Romans 4.24. He concludes by saying the following, but for ours also, it will be counted to us, that is, we will be considered righteous, we will be declared to be righteous, who believe in Him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And so in the New Testament, we have God's universal message, the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. This is Paul's singular message that is proclaimed throughout the entire world. And in believing upon this, putting our faith in this like Abraham, we may be declared to be righteous. This is the one who wields this shield of faith, the one who believes the gospel. If we believe the gospel, it may be well said that this is the spring from which all other faith flows. If we believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we are going to live our entire life. Each step that we take, naturally, we are going to trust in God in every area of our life. We are going to believe in the entire testimony of Scripture. I believe this is the sense and the argumentation that is given in Romans 8, 32, when Paul gives us these amazing words, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And so follow this train of thought, this logic from the apostle. Consider that if God has given us the most costly of all things in the universe, if he has demonstrated infinite love in the gospel, if he has demonstrated infinite power in Jesus Christ, if he has given us the greatest of all gifts, and if we believe that, is it not also logical that God will, with Jesus Christ, give us all things? And so the pinnacle of faith is to believe savingly in the death, burial, and the resurrection. The one who has truly believed the gospel in his heart of hearts, this is the one who walks in faith. This is the one 
who is a son or a daughter of Abraham, who lives, as the prophet says, by faith. Gurnall, in some of his commentary on this 16th verse of the 6th chapter in Ephesians, he gives us a warning. It's uh, very important that we uh, question ourselves, that we look into the innermost part of our deceiving heart to answer this question, do we have justifying faith? Do we have saving faith? Have we believed the gospel? Have we applied these things to our hearts? Let me illustrate in uh, this way. It's one thing if I were to say that I believe that food exists. It, it is uh, one thing if I uh, have great knowledge about food to the extent that I have the ability to prepare a uh, five-star meal, that I have the knowledge that I can write books about food, but it is entirely a different thing for me to eat this food. And so it's not just intellectual belief to say that I believe that food exists, but I must um, eat this food in order that I might receive the life and the benefits that are within this food. It is one thing to be on an airplane that is um, about to crash and to believe that a parachute exists, to believe that in every way that parachute has the ability to save my life, to believe that it has the ability to save everyone on the plane, but it is an entirely different thing to add to that action and a saving faith to put on this parachute and to trust it and to uh, pull the lever in order for it to save my life in the same way. As it relates to the gospel, there are many in the world who believe in God, like the demons, and, and shudder uh, with reverence. But how many have applied the gospel to their heart, who have believed savingly, who are walking in the faith, who have trusted with their whole being? I think we get a piece of wisdom as we look at Philip in the book of Acts in the eighth chapter as he is traveling along the way, we have a divine encounter. In Acts chapter 8, verse 36, we read the following. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. So Philip has been uh, explaining the book of Isaiah to the Ethiopian eunuch. He has, from this uh, text, explained the gospel and they arrive at water, and we continue reading. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And so we have the eunuch who is asking of Philip. Um, he is desiring to be a candidate for baptism. He is wanting to become a Christian. Notice what um, is said by Philip in verse 37. Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And notice here the language. This is a belief that incorporates our whole being. Philip asked the unit to believe with all of his heart. It is not enough just to believe the historical fact of Jesus Christ, but we must believe Him with our whole being. We must trust Him. We must believe that God came to save us, and that belief must, like the eunuch, encourage us to move forward in action to receive the grace of God, to have our sins washed away, and then to live by that same faith of Abraham that the Bible teaches. So as we continue, this, um, this shield of faith with which 
we have the ability to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Um, it gives us the ability to overcome lies and unbelief from the enemy. Consider the following. If a tree is sick and diseased many time, times, the best solution is simply to fertilize that tree. The arborist uh, may very well treat the symptoms, but at the, at the root, the, the cause of this tree's sickness very likely could simply be a lack of proper fertilizer and nutrition. In the same um, train of thought we have in the book of Galatians chapter 5, 16, referring to our spirituality, these words which are spoken, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so instead of living our days going around saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to restrain the desire to conform to these desires of the flesh, the solution and the answer is to be filled with the fullness of God, to have the Holy Spirit shed abroad in our hearts, to be full and satisfied and content with Him, to walk according to the desires of the Spirit. And by doing that, we will have no need and we will not be tempted by the desires of the flesh in the very same way as we think of this mortal struggle between faith in God and unbelief. The solution to an unbelieving generation is to walk in faith, to immerse ourselves with the Word of God. We understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We are to hear this Word. We are to cultivate supernaturally faith as we look intently into the perfect law of liberty and meditate upon the Word of God. And as we walk according to faith, this is the greatest solution for unbelief and doubt in our own life. Let me give you an example as we turn to the Old Testament to find a picture of, of warfare. This is very enlightening as we try to understand um, along the same lines as the apostle, this warfare that the Christian is engaged in. In 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, verse 10, we have one of the most famous conflicts between Goliath and the armies of Saul, the armies of the living God. And I want you to notice here the flaming darts that this champion, this giant who represents the Philistines, that he uh, spoke to the armies of, of God. 1 Samuel 17, verse 10, And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And so I want us to consider these lies. Such deadly words caused the entire army of God to forget the faithfulness of their God, to forget His power, and to turn from faith and confidence to unbelief and fear and to tremble before this type of the devil. Notice here the power of these lies and these verbal flaming darts that are shot against the armies of the Lord. And as dreadful as this foe is, and perhaps beyond um, our comprehension, to think about having to fight a giant, someone of the stature of Goliath, consider once more these words from the apostle. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not stand against Goliath and, and giants, but against 
principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And so our enemy is, by degrees, infinitely more powerful and dreadful than Goliath. And so we must take warning, we must take heed of the necessity to put on this shield of faith that we are not struck like the armies of Israel by these lies that blaspheme our great and faithful God. Revelation 12, 12, we have these words speaking of the foe of man, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Woe to Israel that Goliath marched against them, but far greater woes to the people of God who must face the devil who has been cast down among us. The devil also deceives us through our perception. The man who lives by faith sees the invisible. He does not rely on his natural sight. We don't look at our own weakness. We don't look at the broken rubble uh, like Nehemiah who saw the broken walls of Jerusalem. But we look to a faithful God who is limitless in love and power towards the faithful. The Creator God who reveals His strength to those who walk in faith. We are called to be like this man, David, who has the shield of faith, who believes in the Word of God even when all others turn away from him. This is our heritage. This is our calling. This is the um, goal of Christ church, to be a believing people. And so how do you know if you possess and if you are walking in this believing faith? I believe that a simple answer to this would be, uh, in the words of Jesus, you will know them by their fruit. Consider the unbelief of Saul's army was laid bare in the fruit of fear and trembling. It was, it was clear that these people did not trust in God, but rather they had been struck to their soul with these lies based on the fruit of fear and trem trembling. Those who have not taken up the whole armor of God, whose hearts have been pierced by the fiery darts, live in unbelief and manifest fruits of corruption. Their soul will be characterized by fear, anxiety, and an absence of all that is of the Lord. For those who have the shield of faith, how do we know if we have the shield of faith the fruits that they produce will be entirely unlike this unbelieving army that we have witnessed, but they will be characterized by security as they trust in a God who protects them. They will have peace in their soul even when the devil makes war against them. This is the evidence of their faith. They will be a people of confidence even when their natural perception deceives them and tells them that all is lost and they will be characterized with such a heavenly joy as they walk from victory to victory, trusting in the deliverance of God. And so we may apply these things to our hearts to ask if we, in fact, have this shield of faith in the fruits of confidence in the protection of our God. I want us to look at one other example in the Old Testament as we consider this theme of warfare. One of my favorite psalms, this is a psalm of David, the third psalm. We see a similar war that is taking place in this man's soul. We may discern what it is to have the shield of faith. Psalm 3, I'm going to walk through this entire psalm with us. 
David says, O Lord, how many are my foes. And how true this is of the saints of God. How endless are those who come against us. Both spiritual powers and those who are ungodly on the broad path. There is no end to those who set themselves against the faithful and the godly. Uh, Many are our foes. Many are rising against me. This is the sense of our text this morning, that the devil is at the gate. He is a roaring lion. He comes against us. This is not a time of peace, but this is a time of war. And then notice this all-important verse in verse 2. Notice the voice here of the enemy. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. So this is the voice of the devil. This is the voice of the enemy as David is surrounded on every side in so many different situations in his life, notice that the majority, the vast, overwhelming voice of the devil, of those within the congregation of God, those without the congregation of God, are declaring this one message that there is no salvation for David, for the anointed, and God all is lost There is no salvation. And so notice that David, we will see that he throws off this lie because he has the shield of faith. He rejects this this voice. But how, uh, friend, I want to, to appeal to you that this applies to us in our own life. We are surrounded by enemies. The devil has a plan for your life The demons are more powerful than anything that we can uh, can come against. The conditions of our community, of of our nation, of the church are hopeless, and, and there are a majority of people out there. This is the voice of Satan saying that the days of the of the church in this country are over. Its influence are are gone, and they project in unbelief as they are parroting the voice of Satan. They say that there will be a steady decline. They say of this very congregation, many say that there is no hope to build a congregation here that is vibrant and full of the Spirit, is an evangelistic, that is growing and thriving and reaching the hearts of people. Many are saying that there is no hope for the Main Street Church of Christ, there are many voices out there that say that someone's been a drug addict for 40 years, they've been homeless, they've been a sinner. Many are there who will declare that there is no salvation for this person. I hope that among the righteous this morning that there will be a holy indignation to throw off the filthy lies of the devil to put up the shield of faith and to believe in the God of the apostle and to take your stand along with David, one man who believes in all the host of the Lord. There's only one man who believes we are to also believe, even if every other person uh, wants wants to live in disbelief. And so notice here, how David proceeds in faith. But you, O Lord, in the face of these arrows and lies, he says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. He sees the Lord as a shield. The Hebrew concept is that the Lord surrounds him all about. And the Lord is our salvation. This is blasphemy to say that God cannot save his people. This is blasphemy to say that Jesus, whose very name means Yahweh, saves to suggest that he cannot save his church. It is absurd to say that God cannot totally save this community. And I will not 
arouse the wrath of God to fall into this camp of the Benny. I will proudly stand in this camp with David and trust in the power and the salvation of God. He is our Savior that would suppose that he has the ability to save. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. And then verse 4, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. And so faith is grounded in one uh, thing above all, that God is a faithful God, that He is a prayer-hearing God, that we might cry out to Him when all is lost. When the devil comes against us to destroy us, we may cry out to the Lord, and He hears us from a perfect place of sovereignty in His holy hill, and He sends divine reinforcements, angels and blessing, and all power to his elect and his holy ones. And look at the the fruit. Look at the product of, of a man who truly believes. Against all odds, we read the following in verse 5. I lie down and sleep. I woke again because the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. This is what it means to walk in biblical faith. When thousands have set themselves against Christ and His anointed and His beloved church, and we have the ability to lay down and sleep in the midst of such chaos because we trust the surpassing, immeasurable power and grace of our God. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked, salvation belongs to the Lord, your blessing be on your people. Faith is grounded in this principle that God can sufficiently deal with any enemy regardless of how numerous, how many thousands come against us, how great they are, what demonic powers they may yield over the children of man, the Lord can crush them under his feet. And salvation belongs to the Lord and the Lord alone. It is the work of Jesus Christ and him alone. All faith is to be placed in him. Salvation belongs to to the Lord. That's why not one ounce of our trust is to be in the flesh, in our money, in our schemes, in all of our creative ideas, in our universities, in our learning, in all of our abilities. If you were to amass every bit of that, it would be absolutely worthless in the scheme of salvation because salvation belongs exclusively to Jesus Christ. Therefore, all of our trust must be in the Lord and in the Lord alone. And so this morning, I would appeal to you, dear people, that we would not disregard this solemn warning from the apostle, that we would acknowledge this dreadful war that we are engaged in as the devil seeks to have our souls condemned to hell. He wants us to fall short. He wants us to be like Israel, to be struck with these arrows of unbelief in the wilderness that hinder us from entering into the rest of God. The apostle makes clear that there is a rest that remains for the elect, and I appeal to you to trust wholly in Jesus. Put up the shield of faith. Believe him, even though the many are going to spew all manner of lies that there's no salvation in God, that we would trust the pinnacle of our faith, which is in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we would apply that 
to our hearts that we would have saving faith, that we, if we were asked by Philip, do we believe with all of our heart that we might declare with the Ethiopian eunuch that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God?